course, that are here at this week and uh, are here today. And I thought it was quite appropriate, actually, we did Genesis 1 to 4 at, at Manitoulin uh, Youth Conference. Uh, and uh, our reading today was Genesis 5. So it's almost like picking up from where we left off in a way, isn't it? But our study, of course, this weekend is going to be on the life of Samson. Now, many of you, of course, will be quite familiar with the lessons that we can learn from the life of Samson, uh, but I find them very helpful indeed, even at my age, because the problems that Samson had are pretty common to man. The, the difficulties that he faced are uh, difficulties that have been faced by all men at, in all times. And so the world in which we live is very astute at producing uh, the kinds of things that can appeal to the nature that we bear. And we're going to learn some lessons from Sam, some very important lessons, both negative and positive lessons, over the course of our studies this weekend, God willing. But I wanted to spend tonight, seeing that there may well be some who are still coming this way, to join us tomorrow, uh, or later on this evening, to have an introductory study. So we're not going to get into the, to the body of the, or the meat of the life of Samson uh, tonight, but we are going to introduce uh, the record of Judges 13 to 16 and do a little bit of background work in the book of Judges as well as just see what it was like to live in those times. And I think we're going to find young people that we can compare very, very nicely the times in which Samson and other judges had to endure with those of our day. And of course our title is suggestive of that because we live very much in a world where every man does right in his own eyes. And that was the spirit of the times in which Samson lived. Now, the book of Judges is an amazing book. It is a book of history and some of it quite bloodthirsty. Some of it people you know, even shy away from. The story of Judges 19 to 21 is a, is a shocking story. And yet, you know, the book of Judges is one of the most fantastic books of the Bible because where you have a full record of a judge's life, it is always a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where you don't have a full record, even though there may be some marvellous things done, for example, Judges 3 and verse 31, we have just one verse on a man called Shangar, one of the judges of Israel. He killed 600 men with an ox goat, which is not that far short of Samson killing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. And yet you get one verse on Shangar. Why? Well, because he's not a type of Christ. If he was, there would be a full record. So for every judge where there is a full record, it's about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, I could show you every aspect of the work of Christ, first and second advent, including the rise, the history of the Roman Catholic Church and its destruction at the hands of Christ and the saints. It's all in the book of Judges. It's an absolutely fantastic book. Now we're going to just skirt the fringes of the judges as types of Christ because Samson was intended to be a type of Christ as we will see in our studies tomorrow, God willing. But he didn't turn out to be a kind of type that uh, one could perhaps say was what God expected of him. He didn't quite measure up to the beginnings that he had. And we'll see that in our studies as I said. But what about this, this book of Judges? Well, the first Three chapters or so, chapters 1, verse 1 to 3, verse 6, is about the failure of Israel to consolidate their inheritance. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 16, verse 31, which is, of course, the end of the story of Samson, we have the history of Israel under the judges. But then we have something unusual in a book of the Bible. We have appendices. Now, most of you, of course, you get a book and at the back of most books there's an, there's an appendix of some kind or another. Well, there are two attached to the book of Judges. Appendix 1 is chapter 17 and 18 and we read, of course, 17 tonight. And it's about corruption of doctrine and a breaking of the covenant, by the way. And Appendix 2, chapters 19 to 21, is about corruption of practice. 
Now the significant thing about these appendices is that they're important to us because they tell us about the spirit of the times of the, of the judges because they actually occur, both of these stories, back in chapter 2. Some of you will have made a note, I, I, I think, in your Bibles to that effect. If you haven't got a note to that effect, it's not a bad idea to put a little note in uh, the area of chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, because between those two verses is where these two stories that are the appendix of the book of Judges, that's where they historically occur. We want to talk a little bit about that in a moment. So you might want to join me in Judges chapter 2, and we're just going to read from verse 6 through 10, just to get the, the feel for the times, the early days of the times of the Judges. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 6, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of Yahweh that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Ben Adnan, the servant of Yahweh, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not Yahweh nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So there was generational change. And of course that, that happens, doesn't it? This is part of human history. There's generational change. It's uh, a long time ago, but I can well remember sitting in your position as a teenager, listening to old codgers like me talk about the Bible. And thought, well, I'll never be like him. Well, of course, <coughs> one look in the mirror tells you that there's always going to be change, generational change. Now, Joshua died 110 years of age, and certain of the elders that were his contemporaries overlived him for a little while. The early part of Judges chapter 2 is about a visit by an angel at a place called Bochum, weeping, where Yahweh upbraids his people for their failure to remove the Canaanites from the land. And of course what happened inevitably was that the Israelites eventually began to intermarry with the remaining Canaanites who kept their religion, their false religions, and of course, history tells us that that doesn't work. So there arose a generation after Joshua and the elders that overlived him, and it says, and all that generation who had seen the miracles in the wilderness, or at least had heard about them firsthand, they died out, and there arose a generation that knew not their God. And it was sad because idolatry had become part of everyday life in Israel. And that's why that story of Judges 17 is so interesting because it's about Micah developing the first, or at least the first recorded idol that ended up being the idol that the Danites took way up north to Laish and created the first great apostasy in Israel. So it's in this period that you can see where this arrow is pointing. In this period here that the two appendices of Judges 17 to 21 occur. So how do we prove that? Well, here's a couple of proofs for you. There, there are a number, but here's a couple of them. If you have a look at Judges chapter 18, which is in the first story, the first appendix, and in verse 30 you read this. Judges 18 and verse 30. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershon, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now it is said that that should read the day of the captivity of the ark, and I believe the next verse actually suggests that. It says, and they set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made all the time, that the house of God was in Shiloh. Now Shiloh, of course, is where the ark was uh, when the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, collected it, and took it out to battle against the Philistines, and of course we know that the Philistines captured the ark, and ultimately, of course, it was returned. But it wasn't returned to Shiloh, it was returned to Kirchath Jura. So verse 31 strongly suggests that the commentators who say that this has been altered, 
should read The Captivity of the Ark. Now, there has been another alteration apparently in this verse, verse 30. Because you see, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, was in actual fact the grandson of Moses. And the Sopharim, the people responsible for guarding and copying out the law, the word of God, down through the ages, at some point, we don't know exactly at what point, but at some point they altered the name Moses in the text and put Manasseh. And I wonder why they chose Manasseh. Well, Manasseh just happens to mean causing to forget. And what they were aiming to do was to cause anyone who read this record to forget the fact that in actual fact Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, was a primary uh, culprit in the introduction and the furtherance of the first great idolatrous apostasy in Israel. Now that doesn't go down too well, does it? Uh, on your CV, you might say. That kind of thing doesn't go down too well, especially uh, the people of Israel, the Jews, who loved and in fact idolised Moses to have his grandson mess up big time was not something that they wanted to publicise. And so they changed it, they altered it. But you see, the proof is in the very fact that we have a grandson of Moses because here we are being told that this story actually occurs very early in the period of Judges. In fact, it occurs between verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. In the second story, the second appendix, if you come to Judges 20, you read this, verse 28. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it, that is the ark, in those days, saying, we don't need to read any more than that, because Phinehas, we know, was the grandson of Aaron. So when Aaron died at Mount Hor, he was replaced by his son Eleazar, who became high priest. He led the children of Israel on the land, along with Joshua. And then when he died, uh, sometime after Joshua perhaps, then his son, Phinehas. Now Phinehas had distinguished himself, you'll remember, in the latter portion of the wilderness wandering on the plains of Moab when the women of Midian had come in and that idiot from Simeon called Zimron had taken that doled up Midianitish woman and brought her to the very front of the tabernacle and in an open pavilion displayed the immoral worship of the gods of Midian Phineas was courageous enough to take a javelin and to finish them off in one blow one doesn't need any greater description than that. And that's why God said to him, I'm going to give you a perpetual priesthood. And that man showed his courage. Now, he was the high priest during this second story. So what's that telling you? Well, it's telling you that it happens way back at the beginning of the book of Judges. So we know it's just a couple of little proofs that these appendices are in the earlier part of the book. Well, I put them on the end. Well, they've got nothing to do with the type about Christ that fuels the book of Judges. They've got everything to do with the spirit of the times. And we want to have a look at that spirit of the times. So what's in these appendices? Well, Judges 17, we have the house of Micah manufacturing an idol and creating a false priesthood using the grandson of Moses as their priest. You know, it just shows you how ignorant Micah was when in Judges 17, which we read... He says this at the end of the chapter, verse 13. Then said Micah, Now know I that Yahweh will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. He's a numbskull, isn't he? Levites weren't priests. Some Levites were priests, weren't they? Only the family of Aaron were priests. This man was not from the family of Aaron. He was from the family of Moses. So he wasn't a priest. He'd never been appointed a priest. So it just shows you the ignorance that existed in the mind of this man. And little wonder, look at his mother. She had said, I'm going to give this 1,100 pieces of silver, which we're going to learn in our studies when we come to Delilah. It's quite a large sum of money. She said, I have wholly dedicated this unto Yahweh. Now, her son stole it from her. She made him make an oath of adjuration, which involves the name of God, he says, no, Mama, I didn't pinch it. And later on, I mean, that, 
that brought shame and disgrace to the name of God for a start to tell lies in his name but later on he, he recanted and he said oh mum you know that 1100 pieces of silver that you lost I stole it and she said oh you're a wonderful boy my son now he had a twisted mother you have a twisted mother like that you end up having a twisted boy I mean, he was so twisted, as they say, that when he died, they had to screw him into the ground. He was that twisted. Well, that's Micah. Now, that's the character of the times. I mean, nobody thought anything of this. Along comes this grandson of Moses. Oh, yeah, I'll be your works. Along come the Danites. Oh, we'd like a worship. So they take the idol and the priest of Micah and go up north. Come on, what's happened? to the brotherhood of Israel. Well, what has happened, young people, sadly, is happening again. There was biblical ignorance. There were too many things happening around them. There were too many Canaanites that had been left in the land. Too many glittering things that took the interest of God's people away from his word. And when those who had delivered his word to them finally died out, there were far too few to carry on the task. Far too few to take up the baton and to run with it. And it's a sad fact that it's happening again. I'm very pleased actually, very pleased at what I see in North America with your kids camps and your youth conferences and weekends like this, which of course we have similar things in Australia. We don't have kids camps. And in that, we miss the boat. When you get hold of kids at nine years of age and you teach them how to do a little bit of research and Bible study and you get them to mark their Bibles by the time they get to 16 well they're nearly experts aren't they we start out at 16 too late so there's a lot of young people in this in this country, in this continent both in the US and Canada who are in front when it comes to biblical knowledge, in front of many of our own now I say that at home so you can tell them all your life and put it on Facebook I say it at home. I wouldn't suggest you put it on Facebook. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. I am am very, very pleased to see what has happened. Largely, of course, through the work of of our brother who's long since gone, fallen asleep in Christ, who started the kids' camps. Wonderful brother he was. But we, we in this place, you in this place, are experiencing the benefits of that. What you need to do is to keep it going and to make sure that you can contribute to the development of understanding of the divine principles, and that's the important thing, the divine principles that should govern our lives and be able to demonstrate from the Word of God, one, how to prove that they're right, and two, to feel the impact of the Word in your life, to actually perform them. And that's what this weekend's about and other gatherings that you have. Now, Judges 18, these displaced Danites, as I said, seek a place to dwell because they didn't take their inheritance where God gave it to them and they took, at least 600 of them took Micah, uh, Micah's priest and his gods up north to Laish. Now Judges 19 in the second story, the second appendix is a dreadful story. He's a Levite who doesn't bother to marry the woman that he's living with. He just treats her as a concubine. She was a teddy bear. So she plays around. She runs back to to her father in Bethlehem, Judah. He goes looking for her. And then he finds himself in the town of Gibeah of Benjamin where absolutely hideous things happen. As a result of that, Israel is at war. There's a civil war in which there is probably somewhere between 110,000 and 120,000 casualties. Incredible outcome. So this indignant but hypocritical Israel who had done nothing about the apostasy that was established in Dan. Guess who was among the people who came to sort out? Give you a Benjamin. Yeah. The Danites from the north. Now they called Israel from Dan, that's far in the north, to Beersheba. And there in the multitude of Israel who had come to sort out this terrible problem in Benjamin were people who back home 
had established the first great apostasy and idolatry in Israel and broken Yahweh's covenant. You reckon he's going to tolerate that? You don't mess around with our God. So of the 400,000 men who came, 40,000 perished. He took out a tithe. And we could talk a lot about that. There's a lot of things in these last two stories of the book of Judges that carry on for the rest of the scripture. Some of you perhaps have heard a little bit about that. So how does it end up? Judges 21. Israel breaks more covenants, more oaths. They're in a quandary. And they use dubious methods to find wives for the surviving 600 men of Benjamin because they have slaughtered every single man, old man, woman and child in Benjamin. There was not one female left in Benjamin. They had to find wives from elsewhere in Israel. Hideous stories. But that's what happens. That's what happens when you have change that leads to apostasy. Now in this, in this story, or these two stories at the end of the book, four times you have a statement made. Now it was there in verse 6 of chapter 17. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did, right, did that which was right in his own eyes. Now that occurs again in chapter 18 verse 1, chapter 19 verse 1, chapter 21 verse 25. Not a bad idea just to highlight those in your Bible, because they're there for a reason. Now on two of those occasions, something additional was added to the phrase, there was no king in Israel. In the first and last occurrences, the statement is made, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now if you omit the italicised words in the authorised translation, because in fact the translators are telling you there's no equivalent Hebrew word in the text, it reads this way, every man did right in his own eyes. So this is not so much about sort of, you know, the, the slogan, if it feels good, do it. It's not about people saying, I'm just going to do my own thing. It's about people doing evil and justifying it. That's what it's about. Justifying it. Rationalising it. And that's the world we live in today, is it not? So this was a time of rationalisation and self justification. As we say there, men found a way to justify almost any kind of behaviour like they're doing today and to dress it up in the garb of respectability. So that became the huge problem for the days of the judges where people could just do as they pleased and find a way to justify it in their own eyes. So when men set their own standards, invariably God is left out though his name may be used. And of course we live in a world of humanism where God is, he's been ejected from his position of prominence if he ever had one in human society and he did because many of the principles by which society was governed in ancient times, even 50 years ago, were based upon biblical principles. That's gone. It's completely gone. It's not God who is now at the apex, is it? It's man. So when men make decisions today, God doesn't come into the picture. And the great difference that there has to be, young people, between the world around us and us as Christadelphians, as servants of God and followers of Christ, the great difference that must exist if we are to survive is that in every single consideration and every decision in life that we make, whatever it may be, big or small, God has to be at the top of the list. His interests, his principles have always got to be first. And if they're not, well then you're going to be in trouble at some point. Now brothers and men, you know I couldn't help when I read this thinking, you know it would take me six months to come up with something even remotely equivalent to this. So why reinvent the wheel? This is a brother's lament that I read in a Christadelphian magazine in 2011. He says, we are currently in the golden age of sin. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. The only real sin today is talking about sin. We have the perfect storm of humanism, evolution, and moral relativity in society around us. This has eroded our standards and brought about a moral and doctrinal laxity in our ecclesias. 
in an honest effort to become more loving and kind, we are now threatened by a dynamic of extreme tolerance. In that climate, the tolerant stand idle as people simply do as they please, but swiftly condemn anyone who judges doctrine and behaviour according to biblical standards. Like I said, I couldn't put it better. That is where we're up to today. So that's the world we live in, and that was the world in which the judges lived in, from the very early days of the record of judges. So you've got to know your times to be able to deal with them. It's important that we understand what was happening back then because it's happening all over again. Now you can see the, the nature of this simple chart. We have apostasy down the bottom and strength at the top. We have years along the bottom. There's nothing particularly uh, astute about this. Just, just a pattern of decline. Decline in a large community rarely happens like that, although the decline I have seen in the last few years, not only in the world, but in our community, would make me wonder about that. It's almost like we've gone over the cliff in some, in, in some respects. But it doesn't normally happen that way. Decline normally goes more like that, with incremental changes eroding strength over many decades. Well, there were a people who were given this land, the land promised to Abraham, but they only took portion of it. You see that, that red shading there? That's basically, I mean, I don't think they know completely accurately, but it's basically the territories that were taken by the tribes when they came across the Jordan under Joshua. And they were commanded, Deuteronomy 20 is very, very clear, verses 16 and 17, they were commanded to eradicate from the land every single Canaanite. Now, let's just pause there for a minute. In my travels around this continent, I've come across one or two people who have a real problem with God commanding the complete destruction of Canaanites, men, women and children. I'm, I'm not really surprised at an age of humanism. But in one case, uh, the gentleman, because he's not a brother, the gentleman who sits in our reading sessions, goes out to dinner with us and talks about the Bible, hasn't got baptised. And he's held off for 40 years or more. You know what his problem is? He cannot understand a God who would command the destruction of every living human being in the land of Canaan. Now, do we have a problem with that? Or not if you understand why. Why did God command the eradication of Canaanites? Well, we're going to see why. <coughs> because the failure to do so meant that the bulk of his people will not be in the kingdom. That's why. And moreover, he was establishing a principle. And the principle is very simple. I want you to come to me, and what that means is that you're going to have to crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. Put to death the old man and the Canaanite. In the word of God represents the old man. Those of you who are baptised have in the figure put him to death. You have agreed with that principle. So that's what God was doing. But Israel sort of got around that a little bit. Now, God had forewarned in Deuteronomy 20, and it would be nice to better take you to these passages if we don't have time. He forewarned that Israel would need to be patient and persistent to overthrow some of the cities. And so in Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 and 20, he said, Now listen, some cities you're going to have to lay siege to, but don't you dare cut down the fruit trees. You can cut down the trees that don't bear fruit if you want to make a, you know, a, a siege mound or whatever. But don't cut the fruit trees down because later on when you do capture it you'll need fruit, you'll need food. So you see what he was teaching them was that in dealing with the problem of the Canaanite you're not necessarily going to better get rid of him in one day. In fact, we don't get rid of ours really for a lifetime, do we? We wrestle with him every day. But the point is we know we have to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts and God can work with people of that mindset. Now the house of Joseph traded the divine imperative for the path of convenience. Come back to Judges chapter 1. 
We'll just see, but this is a classic example of how the rock set in. Judges 1, verse 22. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and Yahweh was with them, and the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now it was called last before. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Shall us, we pray, thee the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man, they let go the man and all his family. Sounds like a pretty sort of like, you know, kind thing to do, doesn't it? God had commanded that every Canaanite be killed. So this was a compromise. It was, as we say at the head of that slide, the compromise of convenience. We don't know what the man did, except that it says in verse 26, he went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof last. Now he might have come back one day with an army, we don't know. But they should have just done what God said they should do. And the house of God we know from other places, like in the, in the days of Jeroboam the first, who put golden calves in Bethel and then up in Dan. It's not established by compromise. That only leads to disaster. So what happens? Well the Canaanites prosper to the very great future detriment of Israel. So we have Judges 2 verse 3 which says, And ye shall make no league. This is the angel that comes from Bochum with the inhabitants of the land. Ye shall throw down their altars. If you have not obeyed my voice, why have you done this? Says God through the angel. Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Now, if this message is not clear, I don't know what it is. Because wherever you go, you find the same message. Numbers 33 verse 51 Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them When ye are passed over Jordan to the land of Canaan then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures Pictures? Good grief They didn't have TVs or iPads or computers or iPods or Androids or whatever you call it didn't they? What sort of pictures did they have? They had idols in the same shape as the pictures of the modern world. Yeah. So, while the technology was different, the way the human nature behaves is not different, is it? That's why 70% of internet traffic, and this includes business traffic, is pornography. And when Israel came to the land, they, they confronted idols that would do quite well in today's society. And that, sadly, has to be mentioned, young people, because otherwise we wouldn't be relating what happened back then to what's happening now. So when God said, destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck out pluck down all their high places. That's what he was talking about. Why? Well, because it corrupts morals. And when morals are corrupted, God is pushed away. Simple as that. And so he knew exactly what would happen and it did happen. He goes on to say, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, and it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes. Someone like to come out here and I'm going to poke your eye with my finger. Any, any volunteers? Come on. You haven't got any courage, have you? Of course you won't come out and let me poke you in the eye. Will you? I won't let you do that either. Why not? It's the most sensitive part of your body. Alright? There'll be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. So many in Israel married strange women. And they're lying alongside strange women. Thorns in their sides. Because what happened was that not only were they turned away to apostasy, but their children were turned away. And a generation grew up which knew not Yahweh. And the end result of that 
was utter disaster for literally millions of people who might otherwise have been in the kingdom. That's the story of Judges. And Joshua said the same thing. No, for a certainty. Just before he dies, he calls the elders of Israel. Know for a certainty that Yahweh your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you because you haven't, listen, you will not do it that they should be stairs and traps unto you. Scourges in your side, thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which is given you. It's a clear message, isn't it? So what does that mean to you and me? Well, it means several things, doesn't it? When you're looking for someone to share your life, you look where you should look. You don't look amongst Canaanites. All right? You don't go looking amongst people who do not serve the God that you serve in the way that you know you should serve him. It means keeping separate from as much of this world's evil as is possible. And it's pretty difficult nowadays, isn't it? It means, young people, being on your guard of the influences. You know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.33? I'm going to give you another translation, not the authorised translation, because the AV is not all that good in this particular place. He said, bad companionships corrupt good morals. It's true. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Bad companionships corrupt good morals. That, of course, has been proven by history. So, here was the challenge that Israel now had to confront because they did not take up the cudgels to remove the Canaanite. In his anger, Yahweh decreed he would not drive out the Canaanites but lead them to prove Israel. That's the story of Judges 3, actually. It says there in verse 1, Now these are the nations which Yahweh left to prove Israel or test Israel by them, even as many of Israel as have not known uh, the wars of Canaan. So it was important. This was important for those who had not experienced warfare in taking their inheritance because their parents had let them down. Their parents had not removed the Canaanite and Yahweh says, well, I'm going to leave the Canaanite so that you will learn that you have to fight against him. So it's our position, essentially, because every individual must be tested in the warfare of faith and that happens here, all right? It happens here. My test every day is whether or not I'm going to obey the tendencies of the nature I bear in common with you, whether I'm going to put the things of God first. That's the test. Now we're going to consider a man this weekend called Samson. If you ever wanted an example in scripture of a Christadelphian who struggled almost every day with the basic weaknesses of human nature, you've got him in Samson. We're going to watch this man. He was a wonderful man. There were times when he was taken over by the power of God's Spirit where he did miraculous things and that can happen, even in our lives, through the power of the Word of God. Miraculous things can happen. But there were times when his flesh wholly got the better of him and he was, he was wallowing in the mud of this world and needed to be extracted from it by God. And the only way that God, in the end, could get this man out of the mud was to take away the source of his problem, his eyes. Take away his strength and take away his eyes. You can't see pictures of him with eyes, have you? And we're going to see the lessons that come out of that. So our test comes from being associated by necessity and circumstances with different types of people. We've got neighbours, We've got work colleagues, we've got school colleagues, we've got unbelieving relatives, we have acquaintances, and so on. And I'm sure all of us are in a position where we have to rub shoulders with people that do not share our faith or our hope of being in the kingdom of God. Now, a minority of these may in fact be hostile, but the vast majority will be desirous of peace and friendship. So these are the nations, we're going to see in a moment, that Yahweh led. So let's just go back to this anatomy of collegial decline briefly. Now here's our chart that you saw before. All right, so it's the same basic chart. This is how decline occurs. All right, so what we have here is that minor changes eventually lead to a major change of direction. 
Change then occurs more easily and decline is more rapid. When resolved to confront the changes that are occurring, is weakened, unwise and often ill-conceived decisions change the entire direction of the community. It happened to Israel and it's happened to most generations ever since. If we think we're exempt from that, we're stupid. We're not, we're not exempt from it. We need to confront the reality of what's going on and say, no, I will be no part of that. I'm going to stick with my God and with what we know in the past was right. Stick with it. And you won't win that battle because there's never been one before that you may prevent the rapidity of the decline. And Christ will come very soon, we believe, young people, and sort it all out. So these were the nations that God left. They were the Philistines to roll in the dust. They were the only warlike nation of the four. Guess who Samson has to deal with? Philistines. Yeah. They were ready to fight to protect their own interests and to deliver any vengeance or retribution that they saw fit. And we're going to see a bit of that. Houses and people being burned by Philistines in vengeance. There were the Canaanites. Now, Canaanite means to bend the knee, to humiliate. Now, many of these were merchants. And their policy was always, if, you know, unless it was impossible, always to first try peace. And then you know, they would come and bend the knee and say, you know, we want to be your friends providing you buy my snake oil. All right, so they were merchants. They, they used compromise. They wanted to accommodate you. Then there was the Sidonians. It means to lie in wait to hunt. You know, like an animal that, that is waiting to seize its prey. They were the permissive, the free society. They lured the unwary through immorality and base behaviour, mainly in their religion. And then there were the Hivites. Now, Hivites means a villager. Now, you find all of these mentioned if you have a look at Judges chapter 3 and verse 3. So here are the nations that Yahweh left. The five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon, etc. Now, the Hivites were just ordinary village people. You know, they're mentioned in chapter 18, in fact, in verse 7. That, you know, they just, they lived a... Like the Sidonians, they lived a quiet, peaceable life. They promoted prosperity and peace through their intermarriage, their trade and compromise. You know in Genesis 34, when Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, went into the city of Shechem, and she got involved with the prince of the city, whose name was Shechem, and was corrupted, those people were high -wise. So guess how they were going to resolve the problem? Their resolution to the problem was... Well, let's just intermarry and we're all one big happy family, surely. Well, of course, the sons of Jacob had different ideas and hundreds of men lost their lives. So that was the high lives. And they, they, they were the corrupt, materialistic society. Now, have a look at those nations. We've got them all today, haven't we? How many of you experience hostility? Well, maybe here and there, you know, when you stand up for something that's right, you might get a bit of hostility. But I'll guarantee that most of your interactions with people in the world are with people who just want peace. They don't really care. All right, okay? You say you're a Christadelphian. I don't care about that. As long as you come out with me. You, know, you come to the parties with me and we'll down a few and do this and do that. I don't, but I don't really care. You met those sort of people? Yeah. They're pretty hard to combat, aren't they? And that's the ones that Yahweh left. Why? Well, to test Israel, to prove Israel. But, for your sake. And mine. Because we're in exactly the same position today. And we need to see it through the divine eyes. Not our own perspective. So young people... There were six cycles of failure and redemption. Not five, because five is the number of grace. Not seven, because seven is the number of the Spirit and the number of the covenant. Six, as you'd expect. Six, the number of man. It's a sad story. And of course, you know that formula. This is the formula which you can use to describe the content of the book of Judges. Sin brings suffering and seeking God 
brings salvation. So on the left hand column you've got sin. They served Balaam, Judges 3, 7. They did evil. 3, 12, 4, 1, 6, 1, 10, 6, 13, 1. 13, 1 just happens to be the story of Samson. So they suffer. They suffered under the hands of Cushan, Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia, or Babylon, then Eglon, the fat man of Moab, Jabin and Sisera, the serpent, at the seat of the serpent, Midian, the Ammonites, and the Philistines. And in their distress, they cried unto Yahweh. They made supplication to him. And one of the great things about the book of Judges is this, young people, that if, if, in the terrible things that can overtake you when you turn away from God, and sometimes they do, often they do, if in that awful condition, locked up in the prison of your own making, you cry unto your God, he can and will deliver you. And so he provided judges, wonderful men and women, like Deborah and Jael, for example, in the story of Judges chapter 4 and 5. He provided men and women as saviours for his people to deliver them. And one of those was Samson. Now this word judges, shopatim in the Hebrew means rulers, from the verb to put right and then rule. In a time when every man did right in his own eyes, it's important to have people who know what is right and to uphold it. So God provided the answer. Now there were 13 judges in the book of Judges. 12 were called by God and one was called by himself. He was an imposter. His name was Abimelech. He just happens to be a type of the papacy. You know what Abimelech means? Father King. Yeah, that's what the Pope is. Papa. Papa. Father. King. Father King. The first... Pope was Nimrod. Yeah. Father King. First God King. God on earth. Established the kingdom of men. He is typed in Judges chapter 9. Ever wonder why Judges 9 is such a long chapter? 58 verses or whatever it might be. This convoluted story that goes all over the place. Ever wonder? The entire history of the rise, the history the, the destruction of any opposition, the overcoming of the witnesses, it's all there, and ultimately the destruction of that system by Christ to his saints. All there in Judges 9. In a way, young people, that when you see it, your jaw drops and you think, oh, is that there? Yes, it is. That's the book of Judges. It's absolutely fabulous. Now these twelve who were faithful and appointed by God, of course, foreshadowed twelve faithful apostles and then one imposter, Judas, as well. But more importantly, as I said, they foreshadowed the papacy. Six, of course, and this is an important thing. In the chronology of Judges, Abimelech, the self-appointed, was number six in the list. I wonder why. Well, of course, six is the number of man and the number of the man of sin. Of Revelation 13 verse 18 is 666. There is a precision there, just mind blowing. So, in our consideration of the life of Samson, young people, we'd love to have a look at some of those judges. It would take us a little while to get through them. We're just going to focus on this one man. This one man who might have had a much bigger inheritance, a much bigger place to live out his life if it were not for the fact that his tribe failed miserably to take the inheritance that God gave to them in the time of Joshua. Now you can see it there. This was the territory that was ascribed to the tribe of Dan. But they were unable to secure it because there were a number of other peoples around here, Philistines included, who were very warlike. And we're going to take this line down. And so the tribe of Dan was locked up in a very small area. And 600 of them, in the story of Judges 18, migrated north and captured a little town called Laish, right up there. And they took with them from Ephraim, which is here, 
They took from Mount Ephraim Micah's gods and his priest and established the apostasy way up there. But you know who didn't go with them in those early days of Judges? Samson's family. The remainder of Dan was forced onto the heights between Zora and Eshtal. And those two names are going to play an extremely important part in our studies tomorrow. In fact, for the weekend. Two names. We're going to see what they mean in the scheme of things. So here's a little territory that they were locked in, way down there. The camp of Dan, we read of in Judges 18, and again in the story of Samson. The Amorites and the Philistines, the Amorites to the north and the Philistines to the south. So the Amorites pushed them this way, the Philistines pushed them this way, and they ended up between Zorah and Eshtael. So here are the two places that play such an important part in the life of Samson. Now this is a a, a map that's put out, a chart that's put out of where the judges rule. And here, of course, down in the area of the Philistines, is where Samson spent most of his relatively short life. He was amongst this brow-beaten, very dispirited, discouraged people of the tribe of Dan. He was raised up by Yahweh to revive their spirits, but sadly, he was handicapped by a very common human weakness. We're going to talk about that this weekend, and God willing, hopefully learn many very important lessons. Tomorrow we'll start with Samson as a Nazarite unto God from the womb.